And TJ. now to introduce this morning's motivational speaker, Noggle Step board member TJ Ronningen. So, this morning, uh, our opening speaker for Out to Innovate 2019 is Kay Koizumi from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Kay earned a master's degree in international science and technology policy from George Washington University. He worked with the Office of Science and Technology Policy throughout the entire Obama presidency, ending as the assistant director for federal research and development. He is currently a visiting scholar in science policy at AAAS, and his work is focusing on the intersection between public perceptions of science and ensuring that good science is brought to bear in setting government policy. Kay is also a longstanding supporter of Noggle Step and LGBTQ people in STEM. He and I first met at the first Out to Innovate here at USC, and it's been my pleasure to get to know him and continue working with him. Kay grew up in Columbus, Ohio, where I live right now, and so he said I had to mention Columbus. Uh, and I certainly hope he got to experience some of the out and proud LGBT community that's there in Columbus. Please join me in welcoming Kay Koizumi. Good morning, everyone. You are so far away. Uh, I feel so high up here. Okay. Uh, Thank you to everyone for, for coming here. Thanks to the conference organizers at Noggle Step and all the sponsors who made it possible for us all to be here. So I'm really happy to be back in Los Angeles to talk to LGBTQ science and engineering students. Uh, I was honored to participate in the first uh, Out to Innovate at USC nearly a decade ago. Oh my God. Um, six and a half years ago, I had the opportunity to welcome all of you to my hometown of Columbus, Ohio for the second Out to Innovate conference. Uh, this is a STEM conference, so before I talk to you, I guess I should introduce myself and my science. So I'm a social scientist and a science policy practitioner. So first, the social scientist part. Uh, that does not mean a scientist who likes people, although I do. Um, uh, I study people. What kind of people do I study? I study scientists and engineers. So. Uh, I tell my anthropology friends, I'm an anthropologist, but I study this tribe of scientists and engineers. Um, actually, I was at a primatology conference, uh, and, I, and they were saying, oh, I'm a primatologist, I'm a primatologist, and I said, and I said I'm a primatologist too. I study human primates who do science and engineering. Um, so, you know, my research focuses on, uh, as an economist, uh, I study the financial influences, you know, the financial incentives that drive scientists and engineers and students to do what they do. But I'm also a policy practitioner, which means that I, I work at the interface of where science meets public policy, specifically federal government policy because I'm in Washington, D.C. So whether it's at a non-government organization like AAAS or inside the government in the White House, I've been you know, bringing science, public policy, and uh, the public together. So I like to say, as just an introduction, so you know, over two decades, I've been one of the people who's you know, kept the official US government definition of basic research and research and development. So. Like a little thing, little things like that. Um, so I wandered away from my research, but you know, I, I come back to this community, the science and engineering community, because um, the, how public policy, government policy shape all of us as LGBTQ STEM students and professionals is important. So I want to, you know, as we kick off this conference, talk to you a little bit about how public policy, including some of the policies that I've been involved with, have really shaped us as who we are today. Um, you know, during you know, my time at OSTP in the White House and also at AAAS, I was, I've been lucky enough to be part of a team that was encouraging everyone to consider and pursue STEM careers. And by everyone, we meant, and I still mean, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer students, postdocs, fellows, uh, teachers, researchers, and professionals from every part of society. So that means you. We've been trying, for my career, I've been trying to encourage all of us to feel welcome and included in this enterprise that we want to be a part of. 
Now, I know many of us, including myself, have been nervous or downright frightened by some of the changes that have happened in recent years. Um, they happened to coincide with when I had to leave my last job, but uh, okay. Well, we are worried about what is yet to come. Yeah, but I want to take this moment to remind ourselves of where we are and how far we've come. You know, I came out in Columbus, Ohio uh, in the mid-1980s, uh, long before OSTEM chapters, including one at Ohio State, long before Out to Innovate, long before I had any LGBTQ scientists and engineers around me or in front of me. First of all, when I first marched in the Columbus, Ohio Pride Parade in 1985, only three states have passed laws banning discrimination based on sexual orientation. Now, 20 states plus the District of Columbia have laws protecting against employment discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And another two have non-discrimination laws for sexual orientation. And numerous cities and counties in the other states also have non-discrimination laws. And most of these states and cities extend protections in housing and other public accommodations. We still don't have a national law, but now the majority of Americans live in jurisdictions where they're protected from discrimination because of sexual orientation or gender identity. You know, over the last few years, we've accomplished a lot to move LGBTQ Americans closer to full equality. Just one example, and I guess the one that's most personal to me, uh, marriage equality is now the law of the land throughout the land, and that is an in incredible change to me. You know, I've been with my husband, Jeff, who is not here, uh, for almost 21 years. So we've had a wedding in 2002 before it was legal anywhere. Uh, even as recently as a decade ago, when I started working at the White House, my husband, Jeff, was still my roommate or something in the eyes of the federal government, our employer. Then, you know, in just a few short years, we got legally married in the District of Columbia. Then our employer, the federal government, recognized that marriage. And then we had friends getting married in states like Arkansas and Ohio. And now we're fully recognized as married throughout the nation and actually around the world, uh, because Jeff lives in China now, and even the Chinese government kind of sort of recognizes our marriage. So one of the actions that I was the most proud to work on uh, at the White House was federal non-discrimination. The federal government had non-discrimination language in its personnel policies for nearly two decades. And in July of 2014, President Obama signed an executive order prohibiting federal contractors from discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. And that's big, because not only are federal scientists and engineers protected, but also labs, companies, and universities that receive federal contracts, which nearly all of them do. So even if you are in a state that doesn't have non-discrimination protections, all of these exhibitors and sponsors and others who are participating out to innovate uh, are covered. And you know, that EO, unlike a couple of others, still stands for the moment. Um, the Affordable Care Act, again, which also still hangs on, ensures that insurance companies can't deny health insurance to someone just because they are LGBT or Q, nor because of pre-existing health conditions. And insurance companies that offer coverage to opposite-sex spouses can't deny coverage to legally married same-sex couples. Now, we've come so far that, you know, that last thing I said about health insurance, we kind of take for granted. But believe me, a few, a few years ago, that was not the case. And one of the reasons that I didn't, never wanted my husband to get into foreign service was because I did not want to be this unrelated person, you know, tagging along with him around the, the world. So the Obama administration you know, did a lot to tackle bullying to support LGBT students and allies. President Obama himself recorded an It Gets Better video message uh, with White House staff to show our support for LGBT young people. Uh, I am in that video, by the way, a separate frame from President Obama. Um, but um, I, I name checked Ohio, so just you can look for it. Um, all of you are living the social revolution that we've had. Because of us coming out, 
doing the patient work of living our truth with our families, our coworkers, our classmates, our lab mates, our communities, and our society, we are no longer those other people but we see occasionally on a TV screen in stereotypical roles. That was my childhood. Uh, now, now we are everywhere and we are living visibly rich, full lives. It's amazing to me that now, according to some of the social science research I keep up with, more than three quarters of Americans now know someone who is LGB or T. But here's a weird fact. Only around one-fifth of Americans, though, can name a living scientist. So, can you, I, I can't, it's a little strange. That tells me, well, okay, we've done a good job of coming out as LGBT, but maybe we need to come out as scientists or engineers, too. So we need to get those, uh, we need to get those um, figures up. So that brings me to my second point. Putting public policy aside, there's a lot we need to do as researchers and as individuals to do what STEM people do best. Research the problem, identify solutions, and put them into practice. So, as I said, we need to come out because we've got great stories to tell, and we have this research telling us that the best way to break down the barriers between us is to talk to each other, to come out, to tell our truths and live our truths. You know, from my science policy world, you know, the federal government and universities and foundations and companies are all funding research specifically on LGBT health issues. We've always known that lesbians or gay men face certain health disparities and have higher rates of some illnesses than our straight counterparts. But now we are actually doing research. Agencies like the CDC are issuing studies documenting the different health experiences LGBT teens face compared to their non-LGBT peers. In the social sciences, the Census Bureau, universities, uh, so public uh, opinion research organizations are all working to try to ensure fair and accurate counts of all Americans, including the LGBT community. Already, as a result of the last 2010 census, we now know that there are same-sex couples in every single county of the United States, even Polk County, Arkansas, which is where my in-laws are. Um, uh, going forward, we will know more about you know, our families and our lives. In the National Science Foundation, and other agencies in the federal government are funding programs specifically designed to encourage LGBT science and engineering students to pursue STEM studies and careers by working to remove the barriers that exist and to create safe learning environments. NSF is funding projects specifically to encourage queer students to pursue and stay in engineering careers. It comes up with a, now we come up with a little bit of a research problem. So let me tell you about some of the research problems that we are facing. So people say that LGBTQ people are underrepresented in STEM fields. The truth is, we just don't know, because we don't know reliably how many LGBTQ STEM professionals there are. Certainly not in specific institutions or disciplines, nor do we even reliably know what percentage LGBTQ individuals are of the general populations. You know, the surveys cluster around three to five percent, uh, but you should see the error bars. Um, we suspect that as a community, we are well represented in all fields of science and engineering, but for too many of us, we're represented invisibly. And without data documenting underrepresentation, we don't have a solid argument that the LGBTQ community should be part of uh, efforts to address underrepresentation in STEM that include women and members of some racial and ethnic groups. That is a handicap because so many of the STEM diversity and inclusion policies and programs we have are designed to address issues surrounding underrepresentation. As people, we, not be, we may not be underrepresented in numbers, but we do know that our perspectives and our viewpoints are underrepresented because of the pressure to be invisible and the barriers to our full participation in the research and innovation communities. The, the data and the research, including some coming from uh, people at this conference, show that LGBT STEM professionals and students face harassment and discrimination and overt as well as covert pressure to remain in the closet. 
bias does have an impact. We are seeing many more stories and more research about the issues facing LGBTQ scientists and engineers, including a growing body of survey research about the experiences of professionals um, that, by science and engineering discipline that find differences in openness about our identities, varying by discipline and by rank within an institution. There's also research beginning to address what strategies are successful in combating discrimination and bias based on sexual orientation or gender identity in STEM workplaces? The information we have shows that inclusion and participation issues of LGBTQ scientists and engineers are the same on some issues of bias and discrimination as those faced by women and members of underrepresented minorities, and different in other dimensions, such as the pressure to be closeted. So, Many of our science and engineering societies are addressing the challenges and barriers that still remain for LGBTQ scientists. The American Physical Society, the American Astronomical Society, my organization AAAS, and others have all studied their members and have documented that scientists still face pressure to stay in the closet and to hide their truth, and that they have to contend with bias and discrimination in the lab. Therefore, they and we have taken action to improve the situation with safe spaces, changes in society policy, and attempts to change the culture of science. So we all have to do our part. I try to do my small part. In 2012, the White House hosted the first ever LGBT federal career fair at the White House. Mind-blowing to me. Uh, students from all over the country were invited to hear about opportunities for LGBT students to pursue careers in public service in the federal government. I was honored to be part of the STEM section of that career fair to encourage LGBT students visiting the White House to consider STEM career options within the federal government, a topic that I'm going to talk to you about later today at 11 a.m. Now, you know, I've lived long enough and studied enough history to know that history is never a straight line. Progress is never a straight line. And there are detours and there are reversals. In fact, it's one step back for every two steps forward. But this nation has gone forward so much, we will not go all the way back. Why not? Because we will not let it. I'm not going to give the progress in my life and we as a community are not going to give up the progress that we've won together. So I've been lucky enough to be able to be openly gay in college, in grad school, actually in high school as well, uh, and in my, in my workplaces. So I've made a career in science and technology policy as an openly gay Asian American man. And hey, I'm married now. So third, I want to talk to you about some of the challenges that we still have to overcome. But we can do it because I've seen our community do it. And in the 21st century, we have a special responsibility to bring all of us along. Now, I know that many challenges remain, especially for LGBTQ students. Too many of us still grow up isolated and bullied because of our disclosed or perceived sexual orientation or identity. Um, I guess I was lucky. I wasn't really bullied or teased because people thought I was gay by the pe way people did think I was gay from pretty early on. If anything, you know, I probably got it more for being one of only four Asian Americans in my uh, 1,200 student high school. Remember, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, when I came out in high school, you know, to my high school, my entire high school found out pretty quickly because word got, got around, even before the internet. Um, I got through it all right, which, now that I think about it, uh, was a, pretty much a miracle, considering it was the mid-1980s. You know, at this point, I want to give a special shout out to my people, my Asian sisters and brothers. There are a few of you out here. So I know that many of you are struggling with what it means to be gay and Asian, or gayian. Um, I love that. Actually, I had one of these moments last week because I was watching the Netflix show, Dating Around, and on it, one, episode three, there's a gay Asian American man uh, who's featured on a dating show. It's like, wow, I'm happy I lived long enough to see this. And of course, he was talking about being a Gaysian. Um, so believe me, I know there are many people in the LGBT community who don't value us as full members. And there sure are a lot of gay men who will say, I don't date Asians 
to our faces um, or in our dating apps uh, because they don't see Asian men as sexual or desirable, especially scientists and engineers who are looked on as nerds anyway, right? Uh, so, but let me tell you, uh, we are sexual, desirable, and smart, and nerdy, all at the same time. And I know we often have struggles with our families and our Asian communities who don't recognize that there are LGBT people in the Asian community, too. I know many of us have parents and other family members who fully support us being in the sciences and engineering, but are deeply uncomfortable with us being out. For those of you who still aren't out to your parents or who wonder how long it will take for your traditional Asian parents to come around, let me tell you, it might take a long time. Uh, I am really lucky to have wonderfully supportive parents, so supportive that they actually showed up in the audience at the Columbus uh, Out to Innovate conference. Um, actually, they, well, they had to because they had to drop me off. <laughs> um, but let me tell you, they are Japanese, which means I grew up in a traditional Japanese family of the kind that so many of my Asian brothers and sisters will recognize right away. Um, and although they are wonderfully supportive now, so much so that mom is a P-flag mom and marches in the Columbus Pride Parade, uh, it took decades for us to get there. We have to be patient with each other in our families. It takes years for us individually to become comfortable with who we are we are, so it will take years for our families to make that journey too. So my Asians, I have to tell you also that there are people who don't value our accomplishments in science and engineering and technology because hey, you know, Asians are good at science and math naturally, right? Uh, by assuming that we're naturally good at science and math, people use that to value or devalue our accomplishments. So research shows that Asians like me are well represented in the sciences and engineering in North America, but there are barriers. We start out overrepresented in the sciences and engineering and become more so because of the influx of foreign born Asians who come to the United States and Canada and become citizens. But in the United States, the proportion of Asian Americans shrinks at every stage of the career ladder from postdoc to researcher to dean, et cetera or similar ladders in corporations, suggesting strongly that just as with LGBT scientists and engineers, there are barriers for Asian Americans being able to advance in our science and engineering careers. And there is abundant research showing that stereotypes of Asians being good at science and math, but not other skills, have an impact on Asian Americans, even in STEM fields and career, by muting our voices and muting our talents. But through all the challenges, it does get better. It got better. In my undergrad and grad studies, I was fortunate to be supported by friends, by advisors, by universities, and in my career. Please, everyone, seek them out. Mentors, friends, colleagues, advisors. Build your networks and find allies. Let me tell you, because of when and where I grew up, you know, every one of my mentors has been a straight white man you have more opportunity because you have the opportunity to seek out and find more diverse mentors who understand more of you. If you choose to pursue a career or a temporary position with the federal government, which I hope you'll at least consider, I'm here to tell you, you will be supported. In the past several years, the number of LGBT employee support groups has grown substantially at federal science agencies. And it's not just the federal government. The fact that so many institutions and companies are here today and sponsoring us uh, should let you know that yes, they need you. And they need you for who you are. You can be an openly lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, or queer scientist, engineer, innovator, teacher, policymaker, or technologist here in your community or somewhere else. Now, I don't want to exclude anyone. Not everyone here is lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And not everyone here is Asian American. And very few are at the Venn diagram of where I am, where the true groups meet. If we're all going to support each other, and we have to, then we have to meet each other where we are and understand where we're coming from. So I'm telling you where I'm coming from at the intersection of social science, public policy, the LGBTQ community, and the Asian American community. And I'm telling you where I'm coming from 
partly as a way to tell you that where I've been, that you know, from going to high school in Columbus, Ohio, unsure of what I wanted to pursue, I've managed to find my way as an openly gay man working in science policy, working in some pretty fancy places along the way. Uh, and I'm reminded, uh, every time I come to one of these conferences, I'm reminded of you know, where I've been and where we are all going together. So I'm really happy that we are in a beautiful place in beautiful Southern California, a long way from growing up uh, gay in central Ohio in the 1980s, in the middle of um, HIV AIDS panic in middle America. And uh, we have come a long way. But we're not young, done yet because there's too much at stake and not all of us are able to get there yet. Uh, because we know by now that the struggle never ends, but together we are going to keep making progress. And I want all of you to feel welcome to be out and proud as LGBTQ in science and engineering. So I've got your back. We have your back. Let's all innovate together. Thank you.